Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. I am excited that you are joining us once again. Before we dive into this month's episode, I want to draw your attention to ebmedicine.net. Have you seen the CME map that breaks down by state what requirements you need for your license? Have you seen the current topics and controversies in trauma care or in stroke care or the new LLSA guide? Have you seen the EKG course or the laceration course or the interactive pathways? All of those are on the website at ebmedicine.net and in the mobile app. So if you're listening and you're not a subscriber, you should be. And if you are a subscriber, make sure you are taking advantage of all of those resources and all of that special CME. And now let's jump into today's episode. All right, everybody, welcome back to the podcast. I'm Sam Ashu, and on the other side of the microphone is... Dr. T.R. Eckler, somehow still employed in this fantastic job despite my prior mediocre performances. <laughs> somehow. Today, we are in the November 2023 episode, and if you don't know, in November, there were four articles published. Pediatric Emergency Medicine Practice evidence-based urgent care, and a special extra pediatric emergency medicine practice trauma article on pediatric blunt thoracic injuries. So, so much CME, so many topics. We're going to touch on some of these articles, but we're going to spend the bulk of our time in the PEDS EMP article on pediatric diabetes, management of acute complications in the emergency department, and I swear there is some kind of competition going on with our authors, some kind of gamesmanship here, because every month I say this article is jam-packed with information, and I feel like the following month they hand me one that has even more information in it. I'm constantly impressed with how many pearls, pieces of wisdom, little tidbits, and just juicy information they can pack into the articles as I read these in preparation for the podcast, and this is just a little backstory for all of our listeners, I highlight all the information that I specifically want to talk about in the podcast. And this article is just beginning to end one long highlight. Every single page, there is just so much information. It is the quintessential summary of all things DKA and HHS in pediatrics. I think they did just an outstanding job. But I, I think to your point, like this, these reviews seem like they're really timely and they're on top of practice changes for us. I think there's been a significant shift in how we think about fluids and fluid resuscitation in children. And I think they really capture that in this, that you can simplify it down to just start with NS for most kids, for most things. Then once you've got them resuscitated, you can go to other fluids if you need to. But I think that simplifies some of our prior anxiety about which fluid do I start with in kids at what age. Yeah. The authors for this article were Dr. Sanchez and Dr. Rutten, or Rattan, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce that. Pediatric DKA and HHS is something we see pretty consistently in the emergency department. Sometimes it's the new onset diabetes. Sometimes it's a complication of diabetes. Patients don't always know they have it. Interesting, in the introduction, it says, in one study, 34% of children with a new diagnosis of diabetes in the ED had a medical visit in the prior week. And 39% of children presenting the ED with DKA, not just new onset diabetes, but DKA specifically, also had a medical visit in the prior week. So I think that speaks to the importance of making sure you get the diagnosis correctly, picking up on symptoms early, and understanding that a large group of these people have already sought health care in the past week by the time they come to see us and we make the diagnosis. It's not as easy and straightforward as it seems. I feel like that sick kid where I just, you know, don't like the look of them. I always reach for that. Let's just check a glucose, you know? Like yeah. It's one of those really easy things that is is not a big deal. But boy, if you get lucky once in, you know, 20, it's a giant save. And additionally, the fact that these children also have other comorbidities that are going to affect their presentation. So forgetting that they might have obesity, be at risk for hypertension, dyslipidemia, fatty liver disease, I mean, things that we think about in our adult morbidly obese population, but really not in children. 
And then the other complication of seeing patients who are in DKA and then forgetting that there is some disease process that put them there. So the importance of figuring out why they're presenting this way and treating the underlying cause infectious or inflammatory or what have you. There are so many things that are wrapped up in this diagnosis. It's pretty impressive. The two authors searched for all things related to DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, cerebral edema, HHS, hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar, autoimmune, cerebral edema, all kinds of things went into the search to populate the articles from which they drew the evidence. My favorite, of course, is always the PCARN group. I think they, they come up with some amazing studies and so relevant to my practice. In 2018, the authors mentioned the PCARN DKA fluid study group performed a 13-center randomized control trial that analyzed 1,389 episodes of DKA and determined whether infusion rates and or sodium chloride content of fluids impacted long-term outcomes. And that study guides the current fluid therapy and practice for pediatric DKA and is one of really the very few randomized control trials out there from which most of this evidence comes. So I just wanted to put that plug in for the PCAR network. They do outstanding work, and so much of what I do is based on their research. When it comes to etiology and pathophysiology, it's not a rare disease. There's over 130,000 children and adolescents who are diagnosed with diabetes every year. The estimated prevalence of Type 1 diabetes in children is 2 in 1,000. New onset pediatric type 1 diabetes occurs most commonly in age groups 4 to 6 and 10 to 14. Almost all the patients diagnosed with diabetes before 10 have type 1 diabetes. So not a rare phenomenon occurring in this kind of bimodal distribution, 4 to 6 and 10 to 14. And the incidence of new onset type 1 diabetes is increasing annually. So we're seeing more and more of these up to now 1.9% annually. So the numbers certainly speak to the importance of making sure the diagnosis is made. DKA is present at the initial diagnosis of type 1 diabetes 30% of the time in the U.S. and Canada and occurs at a rate of about 6 to 8% per year in children with known type 1 diabetes. So 6 to 8% of your kids with type 1 diabetes are going to have DKA and come to an emergency department at some point in a year. And contrary to what is often assumed, children with type 2 diabetes can also have DKA. We don't often think about that with type 2 diabetes. And one study showed that 13% of children with DKA actually had type 2 diabetes. So it's not something you can differentiate on their index visit if they're in DKA. And just because you know they have type 2 diabetes doesn't mean they can't have DKA. So don't let that blind you to the diagnosis. And lastly, children with HHS, hyperglycemic hyperosmolar syndrome, or mixed DKA HHS, are at significant risk for complications and more often severely dehydrated compared to those with just DKA, although they may actually be more clinically stable at presentation. So just the importance of how tricky it can be to differentiate the two and how DKA can affect both type 1 and type 2 and how People with HHS actually have a larger fluid deficit, sometimes something you may not have been aware of. When it comes to the differential diagnosis, again, the most important thing there is recognizing that the presentation can be pretty vague, especially in the younger population. So fatigue, vomiting, abdominal pain. If they're infants, it's even a greater diagnostic challenge. I actually recall a case in my own practice where We were the receiving facility in transfer for a child thought to have DKA, and the child was an infant. And by the time the child made it to our hospital, had received IV insulin, was on an infusion, had received multiple fluid boluses, was not doing well. Mental status was actually getting worse. But by the time, this is hours later after initial resuscitation, that they made it to our facility, the abdominal exam was abnormal. There was a a rigid abdomen. There seemed to be some diffuse tenderness, maybe even a little peritoneal finding. And I thought, this isn't right for a child who was supposed to just have DKA. We're not making much progress clinically. And now this abdominal exam is quite alarming. And that child ended up having perforated appendicitis and got rushed to surgery. So the initial diagnosis was correct in the sense that they had DKA to deal with, but they 
missed the underlying etiology, which wasn't obvious until many hours later when I was there standing at the bedside and had a peritoneal abdomen to deal with, which kind of drew my attention. Otherwise, I likely would have missed it myself. Yeah, I think th this article just highlighted for me that that I think that my my understanding of DKA in adults was so much like there's all these complicating factors and there's things that are driving it. And in kids, I think I had simplified it down to, oh, the, this is just their diabetes presenting itself. But it's the same thing. They can have that full spectrum to HHS. They can have a bunch of different things, be it infection, be it, you know, something like appendicitis or some other significant emergency that drives them into this. So you've just kind of have such a high level of suspicion as soon as this comes to your doorstep. Yeah, and there's a great table there on page five, differential diagnosis of children with fatigue and vomiting in the emergency department, all things metabolic, infectious, abdominal, genitourinary, and then the other, like head injury and trauma, toxic ingestions. There are so many things that can bring to you a child with fatigue and vomiting that, that you have to keep in mind, especially if you're entertaining the diagnosis of DKA. As always, we start in the pre-hospital setting, and for those colleagues of ours who work in the pre-hospital setting that are listening, this isn't going to come in as any kind of surprise, I don't think. A point of care of glucose is important, and oftentimes really what is going to start us down this pathway, and so that is something that we rely on when our EMS colleagues bring patients to the emergency department all the time. One of the key findings that can be seen on physical exam is isolated tachypnea without really increased work of breathing or desaturation so that a coup small breathing can be unusually remarkable and noted on physical exam. And one thing that our EMS colleagues can bring to our attention if we don't notice it is, hey, we noticed this. You know, their sugar is 300, their respiratory rate is 30, but they're just sitting there talking to me and don't seem to be feeling that shortness of breath. Or they're uptunded and they're tachypnic and their respiratory pattern is abnormal. If you see that kind of respiratory pattern, the consideration is for something metabolic, like some kind of crisis. And if the glucose level is high, it's okay to start giving that fluid bolus. So we're not fluid restricting these patients. Most protocols are going to have some kind of pediatric fluid bolus already there, something in the range of 10 cc's per kilo, isotonic fluid. Normal saline is perfectly great. If there's concern for shock, then starting at 20 cc's per kilo is perfectly acceptable. If the glucose is low, they're hypoglycemic, so less than 70 in the pediatric population, and the patient is symptomatic, then you've got to have to start supplementing dextrose. And at least in our region, our EMS colleagues carry D10 and start that as a continuous infusion. There was a while through COVID where D50 was on great shortage, D25 was on great shortage, and so really all we had was D10 solution even for adults, but that's the common fluid you reach for in pediatrics. Interestingly, I like this calculation. This is not one I've seen before, but they did mention that the dextrose concentration multiplied by the dose in milliliters per kilo should equate 50 as a small rule for how much sugar they're supposed to get and how fast. For example, a child receives 5 milliliters per kilogram of 10% dextrose or D10. So that gets you up to 55 times 10. Or if the fluid you're carrying is D25, 25% dextrose, then the number of milliliters per kilogram is going to go down to 2 milliliters per kilogram. So you're trying to adjust the dose times the concentration of glucose to reach 50. I hadn't heard that rule before, but I do kind of like it as a rule of thumb for how much glucose you're supposed to start them on if they're hypoglycemic. I, I basically simplified this down to the 50, no 50 rule. Because I felt like they were, without saying it, making sure you knew that you shouldn't start off with one of the numbers being 50. It just Because yeah, they don't right. want you to give D50 ever. So I basically took away from this, oh, yeah, I get it. Like, they're trying to make sure you know that you can do anything but D50. Don't do that. That's Zero right. mLs of D50. That's right. <laughs> Another option, glucagon. The dosing is here in the article. 0 0.03 milligrams per kilogram can be given IM, IV, subcutaneously. If the child is small, less than 25 kilos, then they can receive 0 0.5 milligrams total. And if they're over six with an unknown weight or those weighing more than 25 kilos, you can just give them the full milligram. You keep them NPO at that point. Another warning for pre-hospital colleagues was about intubation. And this really carries well into the emergency department and through their ICU stay. So th this is not just for our pre-hospital colleagues, but they did stress it here that intubation 
of a child who has DKA, who is tachypneic and Kussmaul breathing, is a terrible idea and should only be done as a very last resort, specifically because of the physiology of that breathing pattern. You're going to be unable to recreate that kind of tachypnea once they're intubated, and they're blowing off a bunch of CO2 to compensate for their acidosis. And as soon as you intubate them and paralyze them and take away that ability, they're no longer compensating for that acidosis. And then that becomes a, a terminal move in a lot of cases. So really should be a, a completely last resort. In- I, I liked their definition exactly that like you reserve it for severely obtunded people or unconscious people if they can't swallow, like with abnormal airway protective reflexes. That felt like the right moment for me where you're like, you know, they're vomiting. I feel like they're aspirating. I feel like I, I, I don't have any, I have nowhere left to turn but to protect their airway. I thought that was a reasonable point where you have to intervene because as you said, you really want to have to never intubate these people if you don't have to. But that felt like a reasonable line in the sand. Yeah, yeah, great point. Once they finally make it to the emergency department and it's time for us to get a history, we're relying mostly on history from the parents. Hopefully they're there at the bedside. If EMS has already obtained some of this, this is also helpful. There are a ton of questions here. Everything from, have they been sick? Did you guys recently go to an urgent care? Have you been sick with URI, something going wrong in the family? Have they had vomiting? Have they had diarrhea? Have they been drinking or eating? Has there been a change in their pattern? Have you noticed they're peeing more frequently? Have you noticed they're thirsty all the time? And then there are some typical developmental things. If it's a female patient, when was the onset of menarche? Has the child been growing well? Is there something wrong with their growth trajectory? Are there weight changes? Asking about clothing. Do their clothes fit correctly or not? Have you noticed that their clothes are more loose? Has there been fatigue, fever, episodes of dizziness, thirst, hunger, eating? nighttime bedwetting, nighttime awakening, all of these things become pertinent when you're talking about the child and the history. And then the family history. Is there autoimmune disorders? Is there a history of diabetes, thyroid disorders, GI problems like celiac disease, inflammatory bowel? Are there lupus or pediatric rheumatoid arthritis? Does that run in the family? All of these things are relevant. And then just to add another layer of complication, are there medications that are available at home that they might have ingested, things like metformin. Could they have gotten their hands on insulin? Are there beta blockers in the house? What other medications do they have access to? So many questions and all relevant in this kind of scenario when you're trying to figure out what's going on. And then if they have known diabetes and they're on something like an insulin pump, what's their basal rate? What is the rate that they're supposed to give themselves When they have a meal, when was their last meal? Do they write it down? Do they keep a log? Do you have that log? Do they have one of those continuous glucose monitors? Can we access that? Because that can give you real-time data about what their glucose was doing before the event. And has there been any mental health concerns for the patient? Now, this was an excellent point brought up in the article, but some of our adolescent patients may actually abuse, withhold doses of insulin for weight loss or give themselves extra insulin in a suicide attempt? And has there been a history of depression? Is there any prior history of suicide attempts? Could it have been a deliberate use of the insulin bolus from the pump in order to lower their blood glucose as a suicide attempt? So lots of things to consider in this population that become relevant during the history portion. Yeah, and I think, as you said, the more history you can get from the more sources, the better. You know, having kids myself now, like, I, th- those questions hit home to me that I really do think if you ask these parents, they'd notice like, boy, their clothes weren't fitting as much. Or boy, I'm refilling his water bottle, you know, four or five times before I refill the other kids. Like they'll notice these things if you ask them about them. Yeah. And then I think just to your point, you've also got to look at the history of the patient in the emergency room. If you've got a kid that's coming in glucose high, glucose low on a regular basis, is it something that the kid is doing or is it something the parents are doing? There are some parents that get into a situation where they enjoy having their kid in that I'm taking care of them relationship. And you got to watch out for that to see if this could be something the parents do to their kid. Yeah, absolutely. When it comes to the physical examination, again, I think they made an excellent point that there is that moment that you first walk in the room and just eyeball the patient and you can identify the, the sick patient, the, the pediatric assessment triangle, they call it in the article and the view from the door that includes the general mental state, the appearance, and their work of breathing, 
and maybe their skin all at the same time. Just kind of that quick blink reflex and you go, oh, that's a sick kid. Or, ah, this kid's okay. I've got time to ask 105 questions to the parents. So I really like that they included that in there and they actually verbalized the, the items that you go through as a checklist in your brain with that just quick blink. I really like that. I think that was very well stated. I feel like this is that part of the job where you just start to feel things in your bones and you just look at some of these patients, kids, adults, and you're just like, oh, geez, that's it. I, I feel like this article gets pretty long and pretty dry, but I have one great story like this. I was in a deli in New York City with my dad, just going to get sandwiches for my family or something. And this young kid, like teenager, stumbles in and starts kind of banging on the counter and like slurred speech. And he's I need a cookie. And the, you know, the people in the place were like, what are you doing? Get out of here. And I walked over and I was like, hey, I'll buy this kid whatever he needs. Just give me a couple of cookies or some something to help him. And I basically sat him down and started feeding him a couple of cookies. And I was like, you, you were feeling bad today. And then you took your insulin and you haven't eaten, right? And he looks and goes, yeah. And I was like, do you have a pump? And he kind of showed me his pump. And I was like, okay, can you kind of take your dose down a little bit? And then, you know, just get some food in you and you'll be good. And got him some fluids, got him some food. He was up, looked much better, looked totally back to himself there and walked out like 10 minutes later. And my dad just turned to me and was like, what was that? What? Yeah, well, how did you know that? I'm like, <laughs> what, what else is he doing? He's obviously just a nice diabetic kid that needs a little little glucose. Exactly. He didn't just stumble in drunk asking for a <laughs> cookie. Like noon. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great example of that kind of blink reflex. And hey, you know, you were there to intervene and prevent an ER visit or an ambulance call or a call the police at that point. And that's what we're all doing out in the streets, Ham, hey, just trying to prevent an ER visit any that's way right. we can. Other things you might see on physical exams. So obviously, if they're lethargic or severely altered, then you, know, you might be looking at signs of cerebral edema. If that gets into the severe side of the spectrum, they're going to have that kind of Cushing reflex where they're going to have the bradycardia and the hypertension, maybe have a severe headache or have complained of a severe headache previously. They'll have that obvious mental status change. Oxygen supplementation is okay. And starting two large bore IVs is okay. Starting fluid resuscitation, of course. Then there's the routine things you'll look for on exam and listening for gallops and abnormal heart sounds. Too small breathing is one of those things you can identify usually pretty quickly just by walking in the room. But you might notice that they're taking very deep and very rapid breaths. Rashes and skin manifestations. Echinthosis nigricans is that hyperpigmentation you see in the skin folds that can indicate there's an endocrine problem going on. Honestly, not something I usually run to for my physical examination, but certainly something that can point to, hey, this has been going going for a little while. And then things that might have triggered their DKA or their crisis. Do they have abdominal tenderness? Do you need to consider appendicitis or pancreatitis in the differential? That kind of thing. So all of that becomes relevant during the physical examination. Next step is diagnostic studies. And from this, I got, you are throwing everything in the kitchen sink at this person once you think they have DKA. You're going to start with... And you're doing it every two hours, Sam. Yeah, every that's two right. hours. And you're going to repeat and repeat. <laughs> it is so true. You're going to get that point of care glucose, which is going to start you down this cascade. You're going to place the IVs. And then we're going venous blood gas. If you have a point of care analyzer and you can get something point of care, this is where you're not trying to save money by not ordering a test. You're getting your point of care and you're getting everything you can ahead of time, point of care, because everything else is going to take a while in the lab. None of these results are going to be normal. The lab is going to have to confirm them and respin them and redo this. And then a human being is going to have to check it off and say it's okay before they ever report it to you. And by the time they get around to calling you with a critical result, it's going to be way down the line. So what? use. No, no one ever dilute things five times in the lab and then doesn't call you about right. it. Yeah, Not in our happen. hospital. No way. So, so yes, get a point of care test and get everything you can point of care ahead of time before you send off your blood. A very venous important. blood gas is very helpful. If it includes electrolytes, very helpful. If you can get a lactate, very helpful. If you can get a hemoglobin, a creatinine, Get your EKG done ahead of time. If they're having hyperkalemia associated with their DKA, you might see EKG changes. And then in the main lab, it's everything. It's magnesium, phosphate, hemoglobin A1C, serum osmols, lipid levels, urinalysis, urine pregnancy, maybe a urine drug screen, serum beta-hydroxybutyrate, your complete metabolic profile, and 
anything you can think of is going into that sink in order to try and figure out what is going on with this patient. The criteria for DKA and HHS, once you start to get some of these results back, is listed there on page six. And for DKA, it's a venous pH less than 7.3 or a bicarb less than 18, hyperglycemia greater than 200, and ketosis with a beta-hydroxybutyrate of three or more. Or if you're getting your ketones in your urine, you can get a assessment where it's you know moderate or large urine ketones in the urine that is equivalent to a beta-hydroxybutyrate greater than three. If they're on the other spectrum and they've got HHS, less frequently will they have acidosis. Usually their pH is greater than 7.3. Their glucose is going to be much higher, in the greater than 600 range. Ketosis is mild or just completely absent. The serum bicarb is more than 15. And then, of course, they have the elevation in serum osmolality, usually over 320 milliosmoles per kilogram. Now, that's got to be, you have to order the specific serum osmolality because a lot of people see serum osms in some of their labs, but those are calculated, correct? So this is one of those circumstances where you got to really make sure you order the serum osmolality and have them go through and actually measure it because it's going to significantly differ. Yeah, good point. Sodium is one of those abnormalities we're going to see as well. So low sodium levels are present in, in most patients with DKA or HHS because of the hyperglycemia. So it's kind of a pseudo hyponatremia. A, a normal or corrected sodium level is going to have to be calculated. And the, the formula is there, pull out MD-Calc, whatever it is you need to do, just calculate it. Elevated lipids can also lower your sodium level or give you that pseudo hyponatremia. So Sometimes the lab will tell you the specimen is lipemic. I've seen that in adults. I can't say I've ever experienced that in a child, but I have seen it before. And then keeping in mind that you can get common things like acute kidney injury from severe dehydration. Their creatinine might be elevated. A lipase might be helpful if they have epigastric pain and you're entertaining pancreatitis. I mentioned drug screen already, but cocaine specifically has been associated with recurrent DKA. So sometimes that's helpful if there's an inclination that there might be drug use going on. And it's pretty rare to have near normal serum glucose levels during the ED evaluation. But if you do, that doesn't exclude a DKA. So if, you know, we typically say it's over 200, but if it's normal, something else is going on or there's another factor playing in, maybe they got a dose of insulin, maybe they've got a pump and they gave themselves a bolus before they ended up coming. So just keep in mind that the normal glucose does not exclude DKA. Kids, and, and it's, it's important to remember we're talking about kids here. That's why. It's kids are just so much more labile and so much better at masking things yep. because they're so young and they just can handle so much. Yeah. And then if there's concern that there's a bacterial infection, you're going to get your cultures and your chest x-ray and your urine culture and all of those things as well so that you can treat that underlying cause. Mm -hmm. Imaging studies are guided by your suspicion and your differential. So there are things you can get always. You know, we love our CT scans. Head CT imaging is certainly indicated if there's altered mental status. But interestingly, they made a specific point of saying that fluid resuscitation and treatment for altered mental status should not be delayed pending diagnostic studies. So you're not going to wait to make sure their brain is normal on the CT scan before you start IV fluids. They drove that point home multiple times in this article that it isn't the IV fluid that is causing cerebral edema. It's the disease process. It's the DKA and the HHS, the severe dehydration and the volume contraction and the ketosis and all of that that leads to the cerebral edema. And so it's not your fluid resuscitation and you shouldn't be withholding that. But if you do have that concern, we'll get to that in a minute, there is treatment you can initiate if you think that they're starting to go down that cerebral edema pathway. And speaking of treatment, we're not going to start with insulin. I remember the time when we used to give insulin boluses. We don't give insulin boluses anymore. I remember the time where people just turned on the insulin infusion as soon as they hit the door, and we don't do that anymore either. And I remember the time where we, well, let's just say we discussed a plethora of different fluid options and a plethora of different rates of administration. And the latest evidence from the PCARN network on fluid administration says you start in the first hour with something isotonic, normal saline is perfectly acceptable, and you're doing that 10 cc per kilo bolus, 20 cc per kilo if you think they're in shock, and then just reassessing, and it's perfectly okay to repeat it if necessary. And you should not be withholding those fluids because of some concern for cerebral edema down the line. There is this 
well, I should say new to me concept that they also introduced in the treatment algorithm for the two bag system. You ever used mm-hmm. this before? Well, this is something that was coming in vogue when I was in end of medical school, beginning of residency. And it's it basically works really well if you have a protocol where you just say, hey, we're going to do the two bag protocol. If you're trying to do it on the fly, it bumps into everyone's, ah, but we're going to mix the bags. If it's literally, oh, you just order this thing and then it pops up, it's nice. Because then after that, it makes total sense. You just go up or down on the sugar that comes out of the two bags mixing, depending on what the sugar is. Yeah. And this, if you haven't seen it, it's on page seven. There's a, a sample table there. Easy to start your own institutional protocol. If you don't have one, I know at our hospital, I don't think we have a two bag system protocol, but I really like the idea. The, the idea is that the first bag is normal saline plus potassium. The second bag is D10 plus normal saline plus potassium. And you're going to titrate how much of each one you need depending on whatever the serum glucose is. If it's over 300, you're giving just the normal saline and potassium bag. Once it starts to dip under 300, you're going to start increasing your D10 and decreasing the one that's strictly without the D10 in some kind of ratio. And they've got it nicely broken down there in the table. And then it goes all the way down until their sugar is less than 150. Once it's less than 150, then you're exclusively giving the D10 normal saline potassium bag and not giving any of that bag that has no sugar in it. So it's a very good way of titrating your glucose, and it can allow you to give as little as 2.5% dextrose solution, which is very nice because sometimes you just need a little bit to, to make sure that they don't get hypoglycemic. All of this is done to prevent hypoglycemia which is the one thing you don't need in a DKA patient. Because as we know, when you're treating the acidosis, you need volume resuscitation. You're going to need prolonged insulin eventually to get them out of the ketosis. And their sugars may come down precipitously once they're on IV insulin. And when they do, that's kind of when it hits the fan because then they're starting to get sick and they're starting to get altered. And now you're wondering, okay, you know, oh no, I've given them too much fluid, which now we know isn't a thing. But they're heading down that cerebral edema pathway, and you're wondering, do I'm supposed to give them mannitol? What am I supposed to be doing now? And the answer is no. Their sugar dropped to 55, and we just weren't keeping up with it. So it's very labor-intensive, and it is certainly critical care in the pediatric setting, but it is totally worth it, and it helps you stay on top of that, that sugar to make sure they're hypoglycemic. Can I tell you, having been in a lot of little rural hospitals, I have had the experience many times with... Not young kids. I feel like young kids, pretty easy to get that transfer to happen, but teenagers and adults that are in DK, where I'd call my hospitalist and say, well, you know, I want to admit this and, you know, get them out of DK. And they'd say, oh, they're too sick. We can't admit them here. They got to go somewhere else. And I'd call the other hospital and they'd say, I mean, that's just DK. You know, we're, we have no beds and we're not accepting right now. So just close them there. So I've closed so many gaps on so many DKs over like eight to 12 hours. And I would tell you that I've set up these two bag protocols. I've used a lot of LR and it's something that I think it's like for some people, it's really scary. They're used to just initiating it, but it's really fun to do because you get to really watch the patient get better. And if if you kind of know when to basically go up and down the glucose, you can see the gap close. You can do your labs every two hours. It's really gratifying and you can really stabilize these patients on your own with just the simple tools that you've got. As long as you can get lab tests every couple hours, you can do this. Yeah. Yeah. Great points. And, and just a glucose every hour, if you think they're labile, every 30 minutes. But it's, it is very doable, and I think this article just kind of reinforced that for me, that people shouldn't be afraid to take this on if they feel like they can't get a transfer out or it's bad weather or something. You can handle DK all the way through to stabilize these patients yeah. you know, in, in 12 to 24 hours if they look pretty good. If they're really sick and you're really worried, like, you know, mental status changes they need to go, that's a different story, and that's where you really got to get them to the ICU. They do make the point in here to say, if you're not a pediatric emergency department, but you have access to one, and even if you can't transfer the patient, you can give them a call. Just consult your pediatric emergency medicine fellow or your uh, peds EM colleagues and just say, hey, this is what I'm dealing with. This is what I have. Can you, can I just bounce this off of you and make sure this is heading down the right direction? Because especially in your scenario where you're having to do this all by yourself because you can't get them out, they're very handy. It doesn't always have to be, here, you take this patient and I'm doing the minimum I can to get them out. It can be, hey, I'm just, you know, I'm now going to own this, so can you help me, please? And they'll be more than happy to help you in that scenario. Yeah, because you you can get into little things like, what are you going to do about the osmolality? How are you going to replete phosphate? Some of the other interesting things that you get to. How fast can you replete potassium in kids? 
it's great things to reach out and get help for, because I, I would tell you that there's lots of little nuances to this that need to be appreciated and, and respected. On the scale of DKA, there is the mild and then the moderate to severe. If they're in the mild range, this is with a pH 7.2 to 7.29, they get that initial fluid bolus, whether that's 10 or 20 milliliters per kilo of normal saline, and then you verify the patient's potassium level. So again, it needs to be in the normal range if you're going to consider starting to give insulin, and it needs to be not low. If it's low, that's a reason to withhold insulin and correct the potassium first because that insulin is going to drive that potassium intracellularly and give you a whole host of problems. So check the potassium, then begin regular insulin infusion after that first hour of resuscitation with hourly point-of-care glucose and ketone checks. That's in the mild DKA patients. And they're estimated to have a extracellular volume deficit somewhere 3 to 5%. And so you're resuscitating them with normal saline and then switching to something that's hypotonic, maybe half normal saline at that point. True body weight is used to calculate fluid replacement, not ideal body weight, which was an interesting point they made in the section for fluid resuscitation here. So mild and moderate DKA can resolve in less than 24 hours, but they want us using true body weight rather than ideal body weight when you're trying to calculate total fluid replacement or total fluid losses. That's not something you necessarily have to do in the ED, but if you're going to be hanging on to the patient for a long time, that becomes very relevant, especially if it's an obese patient, which is quite common. They also, they highlighted in that part with the two bag system that after that initial resuscitation, you can use half normal or normal saline or plasmalite or LR. And having done a lot of these, having closed a lot of gaps more in adults than in kids, but I would tell you that I always find that they get faster faster, more quickly with lactated ringers and balanced solutions because you don't have the hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. And I think that's something that you've got to appreciate that for each patient and kind of look at what their labs are and look at where you're going. But I felt less restrained now after the recommendations here in terms of kind of the fluids you can use because this feels a little more like adults and less like you said, the plethora of fluid options we used to have to really yeah. consider. Once you're into this insulin therapy, it's really IV insulin. There is a discussion here of subcutaneous insulin and the rare time where that might be available to use. It really is strongly driven home here. That should be done in consultation with your pediatric endocrinologist with some kind of telehealth consult. Or if you already have an existing institutional protocol, that's okay, but it is not your first choice insulin for these patients. There is a table there, table three, which talks about the types of approved insulin, but so we don't get too far into the weeds. We're just going to say you start with regular insulin and you start at IV and you're going to avoid the sub-Q or the alternative insulins unless there's an endocrinologist helping you manage this patient who's then going to take over their care. And to this point, like if you can't get access on these kids, I feel like one of the things they didn't go as far to say, but this is a kid that needs an IO. You need to be able to resuscitate these kids. And if you can't get access, I don't think that you should hesitate then after a few attempts to get an IV. If they're that dehydrated, then go intraosseous because if you can get fluids into them, their vasculature is going to puff up. You'll be able to get an IV after that. But getting fluid into these kids is the big thing that's going to stabilize them and keep them from progressing. Perfect. The moderate to severe DKA patients, these are the ones with the pH less than 7.2 are managed similarly. So you're still doing that fluid resuscitation up front. It's still 10 to 20 milliliters per kilogram of that isotonic fluid, preferably normal saline, according to the authors, but you know whatever isotonic fluid you have. If they have shock, then you're starting with the 20 milliliter per kilogram boluses and then further fluids as indicated. Some patients with DKA are going to have hypertension. It's an interesting thought that you might limit your fluid resuscitation because of that blood pressure, but the authors specifically say that is the wrong thing to do. So if you notice that they're hypertensive, that's okay, and that's not a reason to under-resuscitate the patient. They still need the fluids. Don't hold it because of blood pressure. Do not assume that they're euvolemic because that's very unlikely to be the case. Additional IV fluid boluses are given until adequate perfusion is restored. And again, if they're in that moderate to severe DKA, then we're looking at 7 to 10% of their body weight as far as fluid deficits go of their true body weight. And so it can be pretty significant. So then if they're down 10% and they're 100 kilos, big, like a big kid, that's 10 liters. 50 kilogram kids down 5 liters. That's, that's a good that's thing a lot to of have fluid. in your brain. 
after that first hour, hyperglycemia should be improving with your fluid boluses anyway, but that's when you're starting to give the regular insulin rate in these moderate to severe DKA patients. And the rates are listed there, 0.1 units per kilo per hour of regular insulin IV. Patients who show a marked sensitivity to insulin, so their glucose is dropping very precipitously, can be cut back to half that, 0.05 units per kilo per hour. And again, driving this point home, an initial loading dose or a bolus of insulin should not be administered. Using an IV insulin bolus can precipitate shock, a rapid change in osmotic pressure, increase the risk for cerebral edema, and exacerbate hypokalemia, and it has not been shown to significantly change the time to resolution of DKA. So don't do it. Verified by Google as well. One <laughs> liter of water does weigh one kilogram. So a child that's 20 kilos, that's down 10%, is down two liters of water. Doesn't mean they need two liters of water in the emergency department in the first two hours, but over 24 to 48 hours, you're looking at putting two liters into that kid. I think that gives you an idea of kind of where you're heading for fluid resuscitation. And if yes. you're hanging on to these kids and you're going to manage them for a longer period, it gives you a sense of where you're going and kind of lets you go through and calculate their maintenance rate, but also make sure you can see where you're getting to make sure you get back to them being fluid yep. resuscitated. And I know all of our listeners are experienced, but we talk about water weight because you're not giving water. You're never giving free water to any, any kind of scenario like this. So we're, we're talking about just about water weight. You're going to give it back in some kind of salt solution. Treatment with insulin infusion is usually continued until the pH is greater than 7.3. Their serum bicarb is at least 18. The beta hydroxybutyrate is dropped less than one. And when the anion gap is closing. So these are the measures that you're going to use for when the insulin comes off. And again, if you're hanging on to them for a long period of time, that might occur under your care, but hopefully not. And the question you want to ask your receiving facility or your hospitalist is, what long-acting insulin am I giving them once the gap is closed so you can let this become a problem of the past and not another problem in the future? So that's always the, the thing is, this is how you close the door on this, is giving them some long-acting insulin to make sure that now you've got things back in control. Yep. When it comes to potassium, children with DKA have a total body potassium deficit. Uh, and that can be from vomiting, from loss through osmotic diuresis. So their serum potassium, when you measure it, though, can be normal, high, or low at the initial lab time. But that can rapidly decline after you start initiating treatment, which is the reason why we check it and check it again. So you're going to check it when they hit the door, hopefully with a point of care, start that fluid resuscitation, wait the first hour, and then check it again before you start insulin. If it was high to start, and then it's normal an hour later, you're going to start replacing that potassium simultaneously as you start that insulin. Children with an initial potassium less than 3.5 should receive IV potassium replacement at a rate of about 0.5 milliequivalents per kilo per hour, not more than that, before you start insulin. And you're going to repeat that potassium supplementation until the potassium gets up to the range, the normal range, 3.5 to 5.4, and at that point, you can start your insulin. If they're hyperkalemic, then they don't receive potassium supplementation until their potassium level falls to the normal range, so less than 5.5, which seems a little odd to be giving somebody potassium when their potassium level is, say, 5. But you're also giving IV insulin. You know you're going to shift this potassium intracellularly. So once it drops below 5.5, you need to be giving some kind of potassium supplementation once they're on insulin. If they're, a, if they're a 10 kilogram kid, you're giving them five mil equivalents an hour, essentially. If they're yes. a 20 kilogram kid, you give them 10 mil equivalents an hour. I'm not sure I'm going higher than 20 or 10 mil equivalents an hour for a repletion. Are you? No. I mean, honestly, you've probably got a peripheral line in this person anyway. And, you know, now even in your two bag system, it's going to be hard to give more than that. And I, but I always find that in peds, I'm always trying to balance that. All right. Here's my peds dosing. Here's my weight-based dosing. But then where is the line that I stop at? And that was kind of when reading this, that was for me. I was like, if I'm repleting that potassium because they're really low, I think that's about as fast as I would go. Yeah, I agree. I guess it depends on where it is you're starting. I don't often see pediatric DKA with a potassium of 1.5. But if, if it was really that low and you've got two large bore IVs, sure, you could run 10 milliequivalents per IV 
Obviously, they're going to be on a cardiac monitor at that point, and you're going to be checking this way more frequently. But, but that would be the pretty rare case, I think. I had this case in my oral board, Sam, and the child was hypokalemic. And basically, I gave fluids and potassium, and they were like, do you want to start insulin? I was like, what's the potassium? And me and the oral boards guy went back and forth until finally he was like, <laughs> fine, now the potassium is normal. Will you start insulin? And I was like, yes, I will. I'm totally ready to start insulin now. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> yes, yes. If we haven't said it enough times, make sure it's in the normal range before you start the insulin. Not today. Not today, boards guy. That's Not right. today. That's right. There are two types of potassium that you can give. So there's potassium chloride and there's potassium phosphate. And potassium phosphate can be added to their maintenance fluids because hypophosphatemia can occur and is usually pretty asymptomatic, but it's important to replete. Serum phosphate levels should be checked again every two to three hours until they normalize. So that's going to be in that initial battery of blood tests that you get when they hit the door. Patients who have severe hypophosphatemia, so less than one milligram per deciliter, or who have some kind of unexplained weakness or other manifestations of severe hypophosphatemia are going to be more aggressively treated with phosphate infusions. Otherwise, they're actually at higher risk for cardiac arrest. So it's something you have to take very seriously, but something that can be fixed with potassium phosphate and potassium chloride. You could use half and half as you're supplementing potassium, and that's a good way to deal with that. Magnesium and calcium supplementation. So magnesium and calcium deficiency can occur secondary to the DKA and also during phosphate infusion. And these levels also need to be monitored quite frequently in DKA. So hypomagnesemia and hypocalcemia can occur. They can be mild. They can be relatively asymptomatic. If they're symptomatic and they have severely low levels, it should be treated rather quickly with magnesium and calcium supplementation. And these are the people you're going to want on a continuous cardiac monitor. They're probably already on a monitor anyway, realistically, in your ED because they're critically ill. But just in case they weren't, if you're giving IV potassium, IV magnesium, IV calcium, and some phosphate, this person needs to be on a cardiac monitor, one that is actually being monitored by a human being. Not one of those alarms you're not going to listen to, just in case we didn't drive home that point. And it's because they're kids, people want to like, oh, we don't want to bother them with the monitor or things like that. These are the kids that you really got to make sure. Yeah, that's a great point. Everything you would be for an adult and maybe a little bit more. Put the stickers on. Put the stickers on. Sodium bicarb. Don't give it. There's the short bullet. Do not give sodium bicarbonate. Now, in the article, it does say that in patients with DKA and HHS, unless they're in fulminant cardiac arrest or have severe life-threatening hyperkalemia, so as part of that hyperkalemic protocol, or have severe acidosis, which they rate as a pH less than 6.9, with evidence of impaired cardiac function. So not just a low pH, but a low pH with some shock or some kind of cardiac dysrhythmia. Unless they meet those criteria, you are not going to give sodium bicarb. Now, why is that? And that's because there is evidence that you are going to worsen morbidity for this patient by giving them IV sodium bicarbonate. It decreases respiratory drive. It causes an increase in total carbon dioxide and a subsequent fall in cerebral pH. It worsens cerebral edema. And there was a multi-center study of 61 children that demonstrated the treatment with sodium bicarb was associated with cerebral edema and worsening symptoms. So we don't give IV sodium bicarb. Don't do it unless they meet one of these critical illness specific criteria. There is a table, table four on page 10, which runs through all of the electrolytes, summarizes all of the guidelines. I think it's an outstanding table. It'll certainly be something that we include in the interactive pathway. It's a great reference. If you have access to the article, I highly recommend you refer to it when necessary. Hypoglycemia of unknown etiology. This is a section that they, because we're talking about disorders of glucose, when the glucose falls below 50, and you're getting these critical lab results, there are some things you're going to want to send for your lab other than just your CMP, things like a cortisol level, insulin levels, beta-hydroxybutyrate, but also C-peptide, free fatty acids, lactate, ammonia, growth hormone, an acyl carnitine panel. Honestly, I don't even know what that is. I don't think I've ever ordered it in my life, but I'm sure it exists in our catalog. Identifies inborn errors of metabolism. Bingo. Thank you, genetics in medical school. <laughs> 
hey, you retain that information. Well done, sir. Well done. And the most important is that all of these things need to be obtained prior to the administration of dextrose. So before you give them the D10, you need to draw all of these labs. Now, it does say if the patient is unstable, you're not going to delay, obviously, in order to try and get the sample. But if at all possible, you want to send all of these things before you start to give the D10. I think that C-peptide especially is important because that's going to help you identify if they're not a diabetic, but they're coming in hypoglycemic again and again. Yeah. That's someone that's getting exogenous insulin, whether from themselves or somebody else. Yeah. Munchausen syndrome, abuse, something of that sort. So that definitely. Hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar state. There are some key differences there compared to DKA. Since these patients are more likely to be severely dehydrated with fluid deficits, 12 to 15% of body weight. So that's a lot of fluid. And the initial fluid boluses are still actually around 20 milliliters per kilo of normal saline until their intravascular volume is good and their perfusion is adequate. And then you're still going to switch over to half normal at that point at twice the maintenance rate until you get them repleted, which is going to take a lot of time. In contrast to DKA, insulin should not be initiated for patients with HHS until glucose levels are decreasing at a rate of less than 50 milligrams per deciliter per hour. So that sugar level is de going to decrease pretty rapidly as you give these fluid boluses. And once that drop in glucose is starting to slow, then we can talk about starting an insulin drip. And that's even initiated lower than you would for a DKA patient. So 0.025 to 0.05 units per kilo per hour, which is a half to a quarter of what you would give someone in DKA. And if the blood glucose is decreasing at a rate faster than 100 an hour, that's when you're going to consider decreasing your insulin rate if you've already started it until you can get that to a more stable plateau. At some point, you're going to transition your HHS patients to subcutaneous insulin. And again, that's going to be once the serum glucose has dropped to 250 to 300. It's perfectly okay to give that two-bag system in these patients as well. You're going to be monitoring urine output in these patients as well. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Are they making urine? Are we catching up with their volume status? And hyperkalemia is more likely to occur in patients with HHS than DKA. That's hyperkalemia in addition to things like rhabdomyolysis and kidney injury. So that disease process comes with these other diagnoses that we have to keep in mind. And interestingly, patients with HHS are also at higher risk for thrombosis because of that hyperosmolar state, which becomes relevant when you're thinking about doing things like invasive procedures or placing central lines. And the authors go as far as saying, if you're going to place a central line in someone with HHS, don't do it in a high-risk location like the femoral access site, which in a child may actually be your line of choice. So something to keep in mind, these people are hypercoagulable, higher risk for thrombosis, and this may be the thing that puts them at higher risk. Monitoring, like we mentioned, you're going to be getting frequent labs, repeating that basic metabolic panel every two to four hours, along with the blood gas, getting hourly glucose checks, checking mag, phos, calcium every four to six hours. And that's going to be all done, hopefully, in the ICU or by your critical care team. Cerebral edema is one of the complications listed in the article. And it's the one thing that we're always worried about. I thought they did an excellent job of addressing it here. The children who are at the greatest risk for cerebral edema are those that are less than five those with new onset diabetes, those with an elevated urea nitrogen level greater than 20, interestingly enough, and those with an arterial partial pressure of CO2 or PCO2 less than 21 in that severe DKA class. So those are the ones who are at the highest risk for cerebral edema, but it can happen in any of these cases. And the symptoms become clinically significant usually within 12 hours of presentation, but they can occur as late as 48 hours. So Hopefully, they're not sitting in your ED for 12 hours. That It's usually something that's going to occur when they're in the unit. But if you're, again, in that rural setting and hanging on to these patients, something you need to keep in mind. The symptoms vary, but there's usually severe headache, persistent vomiting, lethargy, irritability, elevated blood pressure, maybe bradycardia. And all of this is a gradual process. And if you see it, it's important to address it. Again, the authors do a great job of saying, do not delay treatment to obtain imaging. 
children who are at risk for cerebral edema should be monitored in an ICU setting, but that's probably where they're going anyway. And the Society for Pediatric and Adolescent Diabetes recommends giving either mannitol or hypertonic saline to treat the cerebral edema. So as soon as they start to show symptoms, you're going to address it by giving them one of these medications. The authors do seem to have a favorite between the two. They like the mannitol, 0.5 to 1 gram per kilo, given IV over 10 to 15 minutes. And hopefully, at that point, you see an improvement in about 15 minutes after treatment. You're going to continue their standard maintenance fluid rate during this time to maintain normal blood pressure so that they don't get hypotensive. And mannitol itself has been shown to demonstrate benefits for cerebral blood flow in pediatric patients. If the mannitol doesn't result in an improvement, you can then give hypertonic saline 2.5 to 5 mLs per kilogram over 15 to 20 minutes. The authors did note that theoretically the use of hypertonic saline alone is just as effective for treatment of cerebral edema, but there has been some concern that it can increase mortality. That data is not great, but it's definitely listed there. Some experts use hypertonic saline if the patient has cerebral edema early in the course, when they're still dehydrated. So if your pediatric intensivist is there and they have a preference for hypertonic saline, you don't have to get into an argument. It's just one or the other. These authors prefer mannitol, and that's okay. And understand that it gets repeated if the patient doesn't demonstrate an improvement. And again, they drove home the point that fluid therapy has not been demonstrated as the primary etiology for pediatric cerebral edema, and that this was shown in the PCARN DKA fluid trial, which studied over 1,300 children in a randomized control trial. So give the fluid, give it liberally, and don't worry about causing this because of the fluid you gave them. Other complications like respiratory failure, Again, intubation can be very injurious to this patient, so mechanical ventilation is associated with increasing mortality, and the parameters that you have to set on the ventilator are really never going to approximate their native ability to hyperventilate themselves, so avoid at all costs. Malignant hyperthermia is something that can occur in HHS, so you do have to keep an eye on your patients. You do have to understand that if they develop those symptoms, that if they have a fever and an elevated CPK, that you're going to manage them with dantrolene. This is not someone who's spiking a fever. You're going to give them some IV Tylenol. You do have to understand you might be dealing with malignant hyperthermia. And unfortunately, patients with HHS and malignant hyperthermia rarely survive, even with adequate care. So it is a, a life-threatening emergency. Can I summarize insulin pumps for you? Please. They're continually changing. They always look different. They're really confusing to use. And I feel like I've arrived at my old man status of my career because I just see what the kid's glucose is. And if it's bad, then I take the pump off and I tell him to put it over there on the counter where I can see it. And the pump stays over there so that the pump can't do any more trouble. Yeah. Because maybe it's the pump, maybe it's the kid. I don't know what's going over there. Yeah, I I agree. I think it's okay to start removing some of those factors you think might be contributing. If you're dealing with something other than DKA, they just happen to have a pump on, they have some other illness, that would be a reason to leave it because they're liable to get hyperglycemic in that scenario. And obviously, the family's usually pretty knowledgeable about it. I find that the continuous glucose monitors are actually very helpful because they can show you a map of what their sugar was over time, and you can kind of see at what point the patient started to get ill. But yeah, I agree. There are some great pictures here of different types of pumps and a good discussion of where the tubing is and how to remove it and how to turn it off. And really, the short of it is take it off the skin and then turn off the pump, follow the menu, whatever it is. Don't manipulate the menu while the needle is still in the skin, just so that if you do accidentally push the wrong button, then it delivers some insulin. It's not actually going to the patient. Just take it off. And there are times where having closed a gap on people, I've worked with them to restart their pumps and get them going and double check them with a peds endocrinologist for someone that I couldn't transfer just to get them home. And I think that's, again, that point where, you know, if their sugar's high or their sugar's low, you want to take the pump off and take that variable out. But once you fix the problem, then if you can get it restarted and you get the patient home, that's when I want to reintroduce that, that if it's working and everything is there. And, and you know, you've got a trustworthy patient and family. Yeah, and they really need to be well-educated. You know, restarting insulin pumps involves starting a new site, getting a new needle, priming the pump. There's a process there. Patients and their family members know about their sick day regimens. They know their carb ratio and their glucose correction and all of this stuff. And so you're going to be inviting them and engaging them in all of that when you are reconnecting their pump. But 
Yes, absolutely. And with consultation with their endocrinologist. Sick day regimen is a good one. I'm going to start asking that of my patients like, hey, you're feeling bad. Did we start your pump on the sick day because you're not eating and drinking as much? Yeah. I'm interested to see how many people, you know, actually have that set up for their kids or their, their kids know that's an option. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So in summary, the patients are at highest risk for complication from diabetes when they're less than five years old, when they have new onset diabetes, and when they have prolonged symptoms before they present to the emergency department. Any pediatric patient, even the infants with unexplained vomiting, lethargy, or altered mental status should have their glucose checked because it could be DKA presenting. And all patients with DKA or HHS should receive isotonic crystalloid fluid boluses as soon as their illness is identified. So don't withhold the fluid. DKA requires vigorous administration of IV fluids and IV insulin, and so does HHS, but the people with HHS are going to be more volume down than the people with DKA in general. You're going to be monitoring lots of electrolytes and lab values, and you're going to be doing it very often, and that's going to include placing them on a cardiac monitor and performing an EKG. And don't forget about mag and calcium and phosphorus. And then you got to search for the secondary illnesses. So make sure you're not dealing with appendicitis, perforated appendicitis, pancreatitis, rhabdomyolysis, and don't forget about their acute kidney injury and making sure they're making enough urine. And lastly, as soon as they start to show signs of altered mentation and you suspect cerebral edema, you're going to give the therapy. You don't wait for imaging. You can still get the imaging, but give the therapy and make sure you're talking to your ICU colleagues. And that's the summary for pediatric DKA and HHS. Thank you again to the authors, Dr. Sanchez and Dr. Rutten, for writing this article. It is just packed with so much information. You need to go to ebmedicine.net. You need to look at this article. You need to keep it with you. There's an excellent pathway on the management of pediatric DKA in the ED, which we will have an interactive version of on the website soon. And so... I strongly encourage you to look at this article and to keep it handy. It's a fantastic article written exceptionally well. I feel like it it reviewed something that I wanted to be very sure of in my management that I don't get a lot of chances to practice, but I feel better going into it now because I'm sure, as with all these articles, I feel like it, within the next couple of weeks, I always see one of these just because of the frequency of the you know the real emergencies that come through our department. That's right. Also this month in evidence-based urgent care was a discussion of acute asthma exacerbations. What pearls did we pull out of that article? I just thought it was a great review of looking at how you differentiate between mild and moderate and severe asthma. It reminded me of the value of measuring a peak expiratory flow. If you've got someone that, that really doesn't kind of get a sense of how to manage it, giving someone a peak flow meter and, and giving them a sense of how to assess their asthma symptoms, it really has significant value. And then my big takeaway was just in dosing. Albuterol, MDIs, when you have a severe exacerbation, I still think I was telling people to take maybe two, maybe four puffs if they were doing it, but they recommend basically four to eight puffs every 20 minutes in the middle of an exacerbation. I thought that was good advice for some player where like you're out in a rural setting, you can't quickly get back. It gives you a better sense that you can increase that albuterol dose. And you can do the same thing with the ipratropium inhalers if they happen to have both, if they're severe asthmatic. You know, you can do four to eight puffs of either of those every 20 minutes. Lastly, it gave me just a lot of support for my transition in my practice to Decadron for everything. I've been giving more and more Decadron to more and more people because I find that it seems, especially in kids, that one dose handles most of them. And then I give everybody a dose for the road. I think I would increase my dosing. I'd probably been stopping at 10 milligrams for a lot of people. But this really recommends a maximum of 12 to 16 for one to two doses. And... I've really been doing that in adults. I'm probably giving them 10 and in kids, I'm still using 0.6 mg per kilo, but I definitely would now increase to a maximum of 12 to 16. And based on this, be more supported in not necessarily going to prednisone unless it was a patient with COPD or someone I really need prednisone. That's really what handles my sin. Excellent. The other two articles, the EMP article was on methamphetamine toxicity and benzodiazepines remains the mainstay, the first line therapy there. Don't forget about rhabdo because they're often in fights with law enforcement to try and get them to the ER anyway. There's a lot more in that article, so please go and read it. And the trauma extra was on pediatric thoracic trauma. Key takeaway points from there were relative hypoxia might be the only symptom of pulmonary contusion. 
Pigtail catheters are just as adequate for pneumothoraces as standard chest tubes. Patients might have esophageal injuries, so you've got to keep that in mind, and that requires prompt empiric antibiotics. And don't forget that pediatric cardiac injury can still occur even in the setting of a normal EKG and a normal troponin. So keep an eye on the vital signs, put them on a cardiac monitor if they have blunt thoracic trauma. Again, another outstanding article, and that's for trauma CME. So if you work at a trauma center and you need trauma CME hours, there you go. And that's it for this month, my friends. A ton of information, outstanding articles, outstanding authors. Thank you to all of them, and especially to the ones we discussed for pediatric DKA and HHS. And thanks, TR, for another successful podcast. Great to be here, brother. Thanks so much again, and good luck out there in the trenches. All right, friends, that's the end of another episode. I sincerely hope you enjoyed listening. There was so much information in there. Don't forget about ebmedicine.net and all of those resources and about the mobile app, and we will see you next month. Be safe, everyone. Be safe, everyone.